Welcome to all of you. I'm very happy um, you're jo joining us, or actually me, in my empty living room. Um, but that's the world we're living in today. My name is Nike Wentholt. I'm a lecturer at the University of Groningen uh, in the Department of, um, of History. Um, the, the lecture or the, the presentation I'm giving today is actually to replace something we have called the news group. I initiate, initiated it around five weeks ago, um, and I invited students to dis, uh, together discuss the news about the Western Balkans. Because I was teaching courses on history and political developments of the Western Balkans, but I figured it would be nice as well to stay up to date of what was happening there. It's a big irony, of course, that the biggest news event, namely Corona, COVID-19, actually ended this news group um, in its current form. Um, and as much as I'm going to miss the actual discussion part, because that was the most fun when students would themselves present uh, something on the countries they were interested in or even were from, um, I hope this uh, lecture is going to be somewhat of a replacement, at the very least. Um, and perhaps there's, it's going to open up uh, a discussion in, in the comment section. Um, or I might record a second video based on your or your, or your questions. Um, it's all open. Um, it's all uncertain. But also, that is the world we're living in today. I have called this presentation Corona Politics in the Balkans, a perspective from polit political um, history. Because I am a political historian, um, I wrote my, uh, my PhD dissertation on dealing with the violent past in the Balkans, which are all very complicated words, but the specific meaning of them you'll hopefully understand, uh, understand soon. Um, and this means that my specialization allows to um, pick and choose from many different disciplines. Um, because my specialization uh, relates as well to political science, to international relations. And I hope that from this broader perspective, we can um, understand better what is happening in the Western Balkans. So what I've done for today is I've collected a number of, of news articles, a number of news items from the Western Balkans, and identified three perspectives from which we can look at these events. And why, why would this be important? Why would it be important to go beyond, let's say, the live blog of what is happening, um, Corona um, related in the Western Balkans? Why should we um, understand um, or why should we think uh, more broadly about what is happening from the perspective of political history and political science? was not to predict what is going to happen, as, as you might think. Um, historians are notoriously bad at predicting, really. Never trust a historian to predict what's going to happen. There's just one uh, point of consolation here. Everybody is actually really bad at predicting, including political scientists, including uh, IR, uh, inter international relations specialists. And a very good example of how bad we were at predicting is the, actually, actually the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, in my defense, I wasn't born, so I could not possibly have predicted it. Um, but my, let's say, uh, colleagues from another generation also did not predict that the Soviet Union was going to fall. Um, and there's good reason for this. We as historians are interested in the particular, in the specific in human agency, in actors, and um, adding it all up in the messiness of history. And this messiness of history, this possibility, this potential for, for humans to change the course of history, for the unexpected to happen, actually explains why it's so difficult to predict. So we will not be trying to predict where things are going in the Western Balkans. But I think we're already doing an awesome, awesome job if we are better in understanding what is happening today. And if we all have some, 
And if we all have some frameworks to understand uh, where do these developments come from? Because what we always like to do as historians, of course, is to emphasize the importance of, of context. And historical context, I am convinced of that, is very important in, what, uh, in understanding the, impli the potential implications and, and the meaning of certain corona-related corona measures. Because while the corona crisis might all have surprised us, and may have seemed to come out of nowhere, the politicians that are actually dealing with corona did not come out of nowhere. They have been in their seats, um, in their, their political um, positions of power for a very long time generally. So it's from that perspective that we are better in, um, in trying to, to understand what certain measures are, are, are trying to do. So today we're going to look at this corner of the world, Southeast Europe, the Western Balkans, the countries I'm going to discuss today are all former Yugoslav countries. Um, but I actually think that the perspectives from where we're going to look at them um, is applicable more globally. So I do invite you to think about these, um, um, these perspectives um, from the region you're interested in. Um, and this all sounds very abstract, so we'll quickly go to these three perspectives. Um, but I realized I haven't explained why I am actually presenting in English, as although you might obviously heard that I am Dutch. Um, this is because uh, many of my students are international students, and I hope they'll be following this um, from wherever they are, are still in the Netherlands or, or back home. Um, so these are the three perspectives that I uh, identified, the three frames, so to say. So the first one is the, um, uh, the focus on, on nation states and the uh, potential implication of geopolitical isolationism that we've been see, seeing around the world. Um, and this is actually quite, quite interesting, right? We are dealing with a global pandemic, something that affects, um, I think, more than 171 countries around the world. Um, a pandemic of which one of the most important characteristics has been that it, um, it spreads, around, uh, spreads across borders so easily. Um, at the same time, we've seen that the most dominant reaction to this global pandemic has been to go back to the level of the nation states. Um, so rather than, for example, in our case, um, nations have started out with closing their own borders, with looking inward. And um, this is something that applies to the whole world, I think, but also it has a very specific um, contextual meaning in the Western Balkans, a very specific historical meaning. The second perspective is securitization. This sounds quite difficult, but securitization is the, the idea, the process, where politicians take something that happens, an issue, a development, and put it in a context of security and employ me measures that are often related to the military, for example, or to uh, wartime um, developments. A very good non-corona related example of this is how uh, many states have been dealing with the inflow of migrants, the inflow of refugees. Um, and this has been very much securitized in the sense that uh, it has been presented as a security problem rather than, for example, problem of human rights or a problem of, uh, of, of refugee international law, for example. Um, another aspect of this is the wartime rhetoric that we've been hearing in many countries and also in the many countries and also in the Western Balkans. The third perspective we're going to use today to look at news is the perspective of dealing with the past of war and authoritarianism. And as you might see from my face, this is something that I am very much fascinated by. It's my specialization. How do political elites use the past of violence? How do they deal with it? How do they draw up laws to commemorate um, a violent past, for example? Um, because let's not forget, uh, in the Western Balkans, many of these countries have a recent past 
of involvement in war and authoritarian regimes. And I think this gives a very specific um, um, extra layer of meaning to the measures from Corona times. So these are the general perspectives. From now on, we'll discuss these perspectives one by one and look at news articles that are um, uh, relevant um, to them. And from here on, I'll warn you as well, the presentation will become a little bit more messy because I'm going to switch between this PowerPoint and um, um, the internet websites, the, the news articles. Um, of course, this is a tribute to the messiness of history. So this is all on purpose, as you may understand. So we start out with this first perspective, the retreats to the national uh, state level and uh, uh, potential occurrences of geopolitical isolationism. As you have seen, I'm holding a book. Um, you know, this is all very fancy, a PowerPoint and Loom and um, uh, uh, digital uh, online classes, but I'm a historian, so whenever I can grab a book, I will. Um, so to understand why um, this perspective is important to understand the situation in the, in the Balkans, we need a short history lesson. Um, and trust me, I love uh, doing history lessons in brief. So I'm going to show you the map of the countries that we are, of the region we're dealing with today. And this is the former Yugoslavia. So you have to imagine that from uh, 1991 onwards, um, Yugoslavia slowly fell apart. And unfortunately, um, did, this went hand in hand with uh, wars and ethnic cleansing. Um, because of the ethnic cleansing, the new states became much more um, ethnically homogenous than they were before. But still, in the new states of the um, the Western Balkans, we see that there are many minorities um, living abroad. So, for example, uh, many Serbs, ethnic Serbs, are living in Croatia, and many um, uh, Albanians are um, uh, are living in in Kosovo. So, Albania is actually not on this map because Albania is uh, not a country of the former Yugoslavia, um, uh, but it, it's it's a similar example. Um, so this means that the current um, borders in, in the former Yugoslavia are actually pretty recent. Some are from 1992, some are from 2006. Montenegro succeeded from um, the Yugoslav rump state in 2006, and uh, Kosovo only declared independence in, in 2008. Um, in fact, many countries around the world do recognize Kosovo, but many also don't. Um, even within the European Union, there are five countries that do not recognize Kosovo as an independent country. So as you may understand, the borders in the Western Balkans are actually pretty contested and actually pretty controversial. And uh, many people, to many people, um, for example, Serbs living in Croatia, um, what is happening in the state of Serbia, even though they're not living there, is very important for them. So this means that when um, political leaders in Western Balkan states actually um, went back to their official borders and started to close the official borders, their official borders, this had big implications for um, people living outside of their borders who may also identify with the main ethnicity uh, from that country. And I'll give an example of that, that later on. Um, and for example, not so long ago, um, the Serbian part of Bosnia, I'll, I'll explain this, this quickly, threatened to succeed from Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, now um, Bosnia and Herzegovina is working together again as, as one state. Um, so this state, um, so this, this aspect really should not be, um, should not be underestimated in its importance. So these are the themes that are interesting um, in this perspective in the Western Balkans. So first, we're going to look at how countries close their borders and what this meant. And then we're going to see if uh, the corona crisis changed everything in terms of the international support and the geopolitical course that these countries 
um, were setting out from themselves. So in terms of the, the closed borders, um, there's a very good example here of, um, of Kosovo, because as you know, um, Kosovar independence is actually um, contested and Serbia does not recognize Kosovar independence. So many countries in the region closed their borders in an early stage, at an early stage, um, because they had the example of Western Europe. So um, even when there were only a couple of people who were infected, um, many countries realized that um, they had to implement strict measures. So Kosovo closed its borders on the 14th uh, of March. Um, so again, quite soon, or at least its land borders. So the news article we're seeing here um, actually shows the border um, with Serbia, so the Kosovar border with Serbia. So as you understand, Kosovo, the Kosovar government, sees this border as an international border, a border between the state of Kosovo and the state of Serbia. The Serbian government, however, as well as many Serbs, see this border as a non-existing border, or in the best case, an, a border between a province of Serbia and Serbia uh, proper. Um, so when Kosovo closed its border, it meant that only Kosovar citizens could still get in. Um, but Serbian citizens, for example, um, for example, could not. So this um, this made very this is a very good illustration of how um, certain political discussions that were already taken place were brought again to the surface um, um, by these corona related measures. Another example of such um, uh, an, um, let's say, complex border um, that was closed um, was the border between uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. Um, because um, Bosnia is a very complex state. Um, since 1995, when a peace agreement was signed, um, Bosnia is made up of two entities. Um, one uh, Serbian and one Serb entity, which is sort of like a ring around Bosnia, here is the coast, um, and a Bosnian Croat entity. And these all have their own um, political functions, their own, um, their own structures. It, it's very complex. They have a, Bosnia as a whole has a rotating presidency, uh, for example, made up of the three main ethnicities, which is Bosniak, often called Bosnian Muslim, Croat and Serb. Um, so this border is between the state of Bosnia and the state of Croatia. But if you enter Bosnia from Cro Croatia, you first enter this Serb part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, called the Republika Srpska. So um, if you now enter Bosnia from Croatia, they will ask whether you live in the Republika Srpska or whether you live in the Bosnian and Croat entity. Because if you live in the Republika Srpska, you can enter. You may have to wait six hours because there are very long queues, as you can see. Um, but you can enter Republika Srpska and you can put yourself in self uh, quarantine for a while. Um, but if you are from the Bosnian Croatian part, you actually are escorted through the Republika Srpska to the part you are living in. Um, so this is another complex border that shows how uh, political authorities have been trying to put these corona-related measures um, into the already quite complex uh, political situation they were, they were dealing with. But we can also look at these perspectives from the development of the geopolitical situation, the broader international situation. Now, almost all the countries, um, or actually all the countries uh, of the former Yugoslavia, um, try to become um, a member of the European Union. One has already succeeded, or actually two have already succeeded, Slovenia and Croatia, but many others are still on the road to European Union accession. They have been so for many years, and as you may understand, many countries and many citizens may understand, many countries and many citizens have become quite tired and quite frustrated, frustrated with this process. 
So actually we have to say has the European Union. So this is a very difficult situation um, where a lot of um, progress is being stalled, a lot of negotiations are being stalled for various reasons. For a long time, the main reason for the negotiations being stalled and stopped was the um, uh, was war criminals, basically, who were indicted by the, the Hague Tribunal um, for the former Yugoslavia, the criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, in the Netherlands. Um, and especially for Serbia, um, it was a very long process and only when the last war criminals were handed over to The Hague, um, the, pro the, the process of European Union accession could be continued again. Um, but even now, with all these war criminals being in The Hague and being imprisoned in Scheveningen and everything, um, it's still very difficult for these countries to actually book um, progress. Um, and a country like Serbia has recently been, let's say, diverting its course. Um, so it's not only pursuing EU membership, but it's also um, um, emphasizing its friendship with a country like Russia. Now, Serbia is actually a candidate member state of the European Union. A country like Bosnia and Herzegovina is a potential candidate member state of the European Union. Now, this is not no corona-related uh, confusion um, that is bothering me here. This is an actual term, right? So, um, Bosnia is even farther re uh, removed from a European Union accession because it's a potential candidate member state. Now, when Corona hits Europe, the European Union soon started implementing some policies relating to exporting certain uh, medical equipment. Um, and at first they made a mistake of not including the Western Balkans into these countries where you could still um, export um, uh, medical equipment to. Um, there was a lot of confusion around this as well. It was actually not that strict, but um, as you can imagine, certain political elites in the Western Balkans felt betrayed by the European Union. And what we're now going to do is we're going to watch a clip of the Serbian president in which he describes this disappointment with the European Union. And he actually comes up with a very interesting alternative to the European Union. So interestingly, you can still see in the background both the flag of Serbia and of the European uh, Union. Um, the clip is with English, English uh, subtitles. And as you can see, YouTube thinks I'm very interested in chess. Um, I'm not really, but who knows what Corona can, uh, can bring me. I'm going to uh, play the clip for you now. I actually forgot um, to take off my uh, my uh, microphone um, to point at the computer, so um, we'll try it once more. Shvatili ste da velika međunarodna solidarnost u stvari ne postoji. Evropska solidarnost ne postoji. To je bila bajka na papiru. Ja sam danas uputio posebno pismo, jer mnogo toga očekujemo i najveće nade polažemo u jedine koji mogu da nam pomognu. U ovoj teškoj situaciji to je Narodna republika Kina. Tražili smo sve od Kine. Tražili smo čak i da nam pošelju lekare. So what we saw here um, is the president of Serbia, Alexander Fucic, um, depending on your perspective, either using the corona crisis to um, strengthen a change of political, of geopolitical course that he has already been preparing, or perhaps feeling forced by the corona crisis to uh, broaden his perspective. Um, I will not tell you which one is the correct one, um, I can only correct one. Um, I can only tell you as a political historian this, that this disappointment with the European Union has been long in the making and that it is indeed true that um, the European Union is not the only um, uh, um, alternative or not the only option uh, for many countries and especially many citizens 
um, are often more negative about the European Union um, uh, than, than its elites. Um, so it's, it's important to, to realize this, that um, the reaction of the European Union um, relating to Corona is going to, to determine um, potentially uh, many of these these countries and their their choices they will making on a geopolitical level um, in the nearby future. Um, another way we can we can look at this perspective is from um, from the uh, um, the diaspora. Uh, many countries in the region have uh, many uh, nationals living abroad. Um, not only minorities living in, in neighboring countries, but also, for example, people working in Germany, people working in Great Britain. Now, we often talk about diaspora in terms of brain drain, so in terms of young people uh, leaving Kosovo, for example, because they cannot find um, uh, employment. Um, but let's not forget that there are also many people uh, working in, um, in, in low educated uh, jobs abroad, like um, cleaning jobs or um, um, working as a waiter. Um, and these people, of course, have been hugely impacted by the corona crisis. Um, some people have not been able to to return to their um, to their jobs uh, because Great Britain has closed its borders or Germany has closed its borders. Um, and other people are actually dependent on family members working in Germany, for example, um, to support them through these very difficult times. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of a news article uh, telling you this story as well. So this is an image we are fortunately all are very uh, accustomed to. Uh, empty uh, terraces, empty restaurants. Um, now it's also snowing in Sarajevo, or it was when this picture was taken on um, the, uh, only the day before yesterday. Um, and here it says that the ter terraces are empty, uh, not only because of the snow, but of course also because of the corona related measures. Uh, this means that for people working in, in restaurants, uh, they are now out of income and they're relying upon people in the diaspora. Um, um, so, for example, here, um, uh, a young um, uh, Bosnian um, man, um, God Mladen, um, tells him that he, he tells the um, Slobodna Evropa that he has tried to, to go to the bank to ask for a solution, but if it's going to worsen, that he will be reliant upon um, family members abroad. Um, and, and this, I think, makes it even more um, important for us uh, as academics to study this, this, this retreat to, this, to the level of the nation state, because actually in these times, it is apparent that, um, let's say, the global community is so important for people's survival. Another example of the changing attitude towards diaspora and towards borders has been a recent um, a call by the Serbian Prime Minister, Anna Brnabic. Um, so normally uh, you see that Serb Serbian politicians really appeal to Serbs abroad and to, to nurture the Serbian identity of Serbs living abroad. But now she has actually told Serbs living abroad that it would be a patriotic act to stay in the countries um, they are living in. Uh, and this, I think, is a, a very interesting uh, change, of course, where Serbs from outside are asked to please stay where they are. Um, and at the same time, we see this nationalist patriotic rhetoric of you know, staying at home being a patriotic act to protect Serbia. So that brings us to the second perspective we are using today, and that is that of securitization. Um, so again, to remind you the, the process of um, portraying issues in terms of security, uh, sometimes even in terms of war, and employing measures that are often uh, used for security and, uh, and war. Um, and this should also not come as a surprise to you. We have seen uh, Macron, you see French is not my forte, um, calling uh, fighting COVID like fighting a war, um, which I think makes very little sense because uh, generally an, an uh, uh, enemy army uh, has a strategy of killing you and has a strategy of um, wanting to achieve whatever they want 
while a virus just wants to wants to survive, um, it doesn't really want anything. It doesn't have a brain. So, um, although even although it sounds very logical to many citizens to describe it as a fight and as, as a war, it's important for us academics to um, uh, to realize that it happens and and what it means. Especially if you consider that a country like France or Netherlands doesn't have a war past, but uh, countries in the former Yugoslavia do. So um, what does this rhetoric trigger? What does this rhetoric um, of war mean? And if this all sounds very abstract to you, I'm going to show you a clip of what is happening in uh, one of the biggest buildings in, in Belgrade right now. Um, it's actually used uh, as a fair for like a marketplace, um, but it's now being turned into a professional hospital, a temporal hospital, actually a place where people with mild symptoms of corona are um, taken from the whole of Serbia to be isolated from the rest of the society um, and where they're being treated but mainly isolated. The building is um, secured by the military and I'm going to show you a little bit how it came about. So as you might have noticed already, I'm showing you the, the uh, articles where, where I got my information from so that if you, if you want, if you understand the local languages, you are very welcome to check it out and to learn more about what is happening. Um, so this clip should show you um, what is going on in, in uh, Belgrade at the moment. So it is in Serbian, um, but please have a look at the um, doctors and military sitting next to each other. One zbog sistema centralne ventilacije. Uslovi ispunjava bolnica na Zvezdari. Tokom ova dva dana imali smo veoma duboke i opširne razgovore. Premijerki i predsjedniku smo predložili da se proširi objem odavira ljudi koji će biti obuhvaćeni testiranjem i kontrolom kako bi se sprečilo dalje širenje zaraze. Osim Beogradskog sajma za prijem pacijenata mogu bi da se koristi i studentski grad u Beogradu, sportski centar Čajer u Nišu i Novosadski sajma. So in the clip, we also saw the um, Chinese experts and the Chinese uh, doctors that have indeed been uh, been sent to Serbia to help out. And um, what has been happening with this this, this Beograd Siam, this this fair, um, is of course very similar to the measures being taken in in China. Uh, and and of course, I understand that especially if you're living uh, in a you know a country that has known peace for a long time, like the Netherlands. Um, Employing the military seems like a very logical, very innocent choice. And um, it's not necessarily problematic, I think. And, and, you know, the military has access to a lot of infrastructure um, that is necessary in, in, in crises like these. Um, but as academics, we need to realize that this is a very um, um, meaningful um, narrative to the, cri to the corona crisis. Um, and you can compare it to the Netherlands, for example, where patients have been transferred from Brabant to Groningen in, in normal buses and in, not in, in, military, uh, in military vehicles. vehicles. Um, so whatever your opinion is on it or whatever your inter interpretation um, is, um, these mil military measures being taken in, in peacetime and this rhetoric of war um, very much is part of a bigger development, a bigger historical development that we've been seeing across the region. Um, in these countries also, a curfew, uh, many countries a curfew has been, um, has been set, countries a curfew has been, um, has been set, so in Dutch, avondklok, so people cannot go out between certain uh, times in the evening and the morning. Um, in Serbia, for example, the elderly are not supposed to go out at all, and quite strict sentences are being applied to violation of these these curfews. So if you go out without a good reason, if you're if you're older, uh, you go out, you can even get a prison sentence. Um, and this is here also, um, you know, police and military is 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 being used to to observe these these new rules. And um, this we can also understand in terms of securitization of a, a health uh, crisis. 
Now, we should not forget that many of these countries have recently known war and authoritarianism. This also means that many citizens and many politicians are very, very sensitive to possible breaches of their human rights, to possible violations of their human rights. Um, so what we've been seeing is that the, the ban on free movement, um, so, you know, the, the uh, a measure that you cannot go out with more than three people or you cannot go out at night has actually met quite some resistance uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of countries. Um, and one of these countries where um, criticism has been expressed on the uh, potential um, ban on, on freedom of movement has been in, uh, in Montenegro. Um, and here the, the political opposition has um, expressed its concern um, that it would strengthen dictatorial tendency, so to say, and violate uh, human rights and, and freedoms. And also, also some constitutional courts have ruled that these measures can only impl be implemented when a national emergency is being um, is uh, is being installed, um, or an in direct translation of the local language, an extraordinary um, state is being called. So we see here a lot of, let's say, democratic control of um, the government's measures. Um, this has also been happening in, in Kosovo, where also the, the constitutional court has um, has examined, uh, has investigated the decision of the Kosovo government to um, um, to ban movement or to limit movement uh, of its of its of its citizens. Um, some human rights activists have also called upon the Council of Europe to um, to study to what extent or to, to judge to what extent um, these uh, measures are breaches of, of human rights. Um, and again, I understand that for, for many of you, this, this might sound quite, I don't know, perhaps a little bit exaggerated, um, but this of course has everything to do to, with the extent in which you trust your government. If you trust, trust Mark Rutte to take uh, responsible measures, you, you will not be worried about potential breaches of human rights. Um, but many of the citizens in the countries of the former Yugoslavia have very good reason um, to, to be wary of, to be sensitive, sensitive of potential authoritarian uh, developments. Um, because one thing we do know as, as historians, really, there are some things we do know, is that once you implement a certain measure, um, it's very difficult to stop it. When you as a politician realize your life is really much easier if you're allowed to track people's movements, uh, to collect their data, um, to close the borders, then you need a very sound democratic structure to abolish these measures after the crisis has ended. Um, so it's important that we as historians, as academics, think, think about the precedent that this may, this may create um, and the, the potential that these measures may lead to political violence um, later on and to authoritarian rule later on. And I actually forgot to show you um, one of the favorite, one of my favorite news articles that I found, um, the Serbian uh, newspaper Politica, one of the oldest newspapers, has actually published the menu that people in this provisional hospital that we've just seen um, get every day. Um, and this is also, I think, a very military menu where for every day it is specified what you get for breakfast, uh, for lunch, for uh, your evening meal for your dinner and even for your snacks. Um, so again, this is militarization, the securitization of the corona crisis. It's not just something that is happening on the highest levels. It is something that many patients uh, with corona symptoms uh, are actually encountering right now in, uh, in Serbia. But this is, of course, uh, more anecdotal than, uh, than a real um, scientific argument I'm making here. So if the, um, the concern of citizens for their violation of human rights and the warning of potential authoritarianism to be strengthened by these corona-related measures sounds far-fetched to you, sounds exaggerated to you, 
I would like to remind you that these countries have this past of, of war and authoritarianism. And it is, can be very insightful to um, put these corona related measures in the bigger development, in the bigger transition um, from war and authoritarianism to peace and democracy. Here, many people might think firstly about um, individual memory um, and about the um, uh, occurrence of, of PTSD in post war countries. Um, and this is definitely a relevant, a relevant issue. Um, and as you know, I, I don't really mind borrowing from other disciplines, but I'm not, definitely not a psychologist. So I'll show you an article um, where an actual psychologist explains the potential consequences of Corona on people who have already experienced war in their lifetimes. So this level of, of trauma of, um, of PTSD is especially relevant in a country like Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, as you may know, the capital of Bos Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sarajevo, was sieged during the war by the Bosnian Serb army several years. Um, so many people stayed, um, were, were locked in, were imprisoned into their own city. Going outside was very dangerous because you could be shot by snipers. Um, from the mountains, from the hills surrounding Sarajevo. Um, so as you can imagine, as you can imagine, the uh, the measures to, to to stay at home, to um, to restrict your movement, um, can trigger a lot of, of memories in people who've been experiencing the war. Um, and I found it insightful that this article that discusses the the general implications of staying at home, of you, you know the four walls coming at you, quite smoothly moves into a discussion of, of wartime memories. Um, and here this psychologist um, tells us that it is important that you realize that this situation is actually not like the war, um, that you, um, here it is, that you calm down, uh, that you uh, try to relax, that you try to convince yourself and try to tell yourself that this situation will not last for years. Um, and also, and this reminds us of the war rhetoric we've been discussing before, that you should not try to compare the situation to the war, as many people do, because that might, might trigger the, the psychology, uh, psychological damage uh, you may have from that time. Um, and this is not something, of course, that only applies to older people. Um, the, the wars in the former Yugoslavia have only ended... Um, 25 years ago, yeah, 25 years ago. Um, so everyone, you know, above the age of 28, 29, um, might have very active memories of, of the siege or of bombings. People in Serbia have the bombings uh, of Na from NATO in, uh, at the end of the 90s. So um, this is actually relevant uh, for a lot of people. Seeing the military out on the street, um, you know, having the curfew, the avant clock being imposed. Um, um, uh, it's, it's very, very hard for, for many people. Um, but we can go beyond um, this level of individual trauma and think uh, more individual trauma and think uh, more, um, more about what it does to a society. Um, so on this level of society, I feel more um, at home as a historian and as a transitional justice scholar, as we often call it, the process of dealing with the, the violent past. Um, what is important to realize is this, this, this corona crisis comes in a time when there's been a lot of historical revision happening across the region. Um, this means that politicians and other powerful people have been trying to rewrite, it's a big word, but rewrite the past or emphasize parts of the past um, that may not reflect the truth, the whole story. Um, and this has been done in a narrative of victimhood and the narrative of heroism. These developments have so far focused mainly on, um, on the, the Second World War, on retelling the narrative of the Second World War. Um, I would love to tell you more about it, but that 
get it's a little bit out of out of the scope of this presentation. Um, but of course, these narratives of, of of heroism and of victimhood are very applicable to the Corona crisis as well. So what we as historians can do, I think, is two things. It's first to realize that the narrative that is now being constructed around the corona crisis um, is um, potentially becomes part of this broader revision of history um, and, 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 and uh, relates to this broader narratives of uh, uh, heroism and um, victimhood. At the same time, it's very well uh, possible that um, the uh, corona crisis will also be, become part of the collective uh, memory. Because collective memory is uh, a concept we are working with in the, the field of, of memory studies, um, and actually uh, many other fields as well. And it's, let's say, that the general memory that a society has, uh, or a group of people have, because they tell each other stories, and because they construct, construct meaning of, of the past. And this is also done through very concrete political measures, like laws on commemoration. Um, so it would be very, very imperative for us historians to watch how the memory of the corona crisis and memory of other crises from history is being institutionalized right now in order perhaps to legitimize the measures that are being taken um, or later on to look back upon the, the corona crisis. Another aspect of dealing with the past of war and authoritarianism in the Western Balkans is that this crisis is um, uh, just one more aspect to the generally very difficult process of transition. After a war or after an authoritarian regime, a country has to implement a lot of changes. It has to change its judicial system, it has to change its security system, it has to change its political system, it has to open the archives of the secret services, um, it has to achieve reconciliation, uh, whatever it is. It's a very difficult term. Um, and what we do see in this corona crisis is that certain difficulties of this general transitional process have been exacerbated or have, been, um, have come to the surface, so to say. The, the cracks in these transition, transitional processes have become very um, um, visible. Um, and a good example here is, is the actual political transition. So who are the leaders that are um, um, that we see now on television in newspapers? And many of them have actually been people from the former regimes. So they have, lit or um, yeah, well, figuratively, often quite literally as well, put on a new jacket and presented themselves as a successor regime, as a new democratic, peaceful regime, while they actually also represent certain policies um, from the past. And this is um, important because the, it also underlines the point we've been making before, that these measures of the corona crisis might actually become part of their, their agenda of um, moving into a more authoritarian, authoritarian future. Um, a very good example um, here is offered by what is happening in, in Kosovo. Actually, why populists love the pandemic is indeed a very insightful uh, title that also applies to, to Hungary, for example. Um, but I thought this was a, a beautiful, beautiful picture, of course, a very typical picture. Um, but in Kosovo, there's now a, a conflict between the president and the prime minister. And they both represent different generations, but also different policies, different um, perspectives on, on the future of Kosovo. Um, what has been fascinating is that Western media have, um, have generally presented this conflict in terms of the corona crisis only. And indeed, they are conflicting in opinions over the corona crisis. Uh, one tells the other that these measures are too strict, etc. 
Um, but it's not the corona crisis only, but the corona crisis is used as a context in which these longer conflicts um, uh, can now take place. Um, what they are also fighting about, for example, is the um, um, is the agreement with Serbia, uh, the border agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, and um, the one you know there's so it's the conflict between the president and the prime minister. One is actually saying that they should redraw the borders, that they should swap land, and the other doesn't want that. Um, but because this is such a difficult discussion to have, um, it, it becomes um, framed in, into uh, measures of the corona crisis only. Um, so here we see again how a general discussion on the past, namely border agreements with Serbia, um, the war, uh, the, the, the past war with Serbia, um, become reframed because of the, the corona crisis. So um, this was the, was the last of the three perspectives we would be discussing today. Um, and I will also want to end here because I think we've been uh, discussing uh, quite a lot already. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, if you would like to, to ask me anything, feel free to, to send me an email or, or, or put a comment, of course, um, under this video. Um, if you liked it, I hope we can um, we can perhaps in the second in the second lecture um, discuss other parts of Corona related measures. I've been thinking about um, the rise of domestic violence um, in the post war society um, in times of Corona, or you know measures on the economy, um, perhaps consequences for elections. Uh, elections have been postponed. What do they mean? Is this a little bit more opportunistic than these political leaders might want to tell us. Um, the, rise of, um, the rise of potential inequality, um, consequences for, for privacy. Um, let me know what you might find interesting. Perhaps there won't be a second video. We never know. But I hope this has given you some frameworks to think more, uh, more broadly about what corona measures uh, mean and how we can think of them as, as academics. Um, now, I want to end with a quote that, um, I, um, that I found in the newsletter of the International Center for Transitional um, Justice. So uh, a research center and also a policy analysis center that asked the question, how people use the past, the, what is the relevance of the violent past in the present day? And I think they have, really um, an interesting point there when they mentioned the following. So I'm quoting here Fernando Travesi, the executive director of the International Center for Transitional Justice. He is saying, medical and public health experts are urging us all to wash our hands frequently and thoroughly. The common expression to wash one's hands of something usually means to absolve oneself of responsibilities for something. In the current global crisis, the meaning seems to have been turned on its head. In washing our hands, hands today, we are accepting, embracing our responsibility for others wherever they are. As we gaze upon the road ahead, may we similarly embrace our responsibility for the most vulnerable and for all victims of human rights violations all over the world. So I'll leave this to you. Think about it perhaps. And um, thank you very much uh, for watching, especially uh, to my students. I hope to, to see you soon. <laughs>